Like many other subjects which are under more or less constant analysis, there are uh, numerous misunderstandings. European alchemy is not of great antiquity, and the rumors about its roots in the mysterious past are highly symbolized. Actually, we have almost nothing on the subject of alchemy in European literature prior to the beginning of the 15th century A.D. And nearly all of the so-called earlier works are backdated. That is, they were prepared and printed after the year 1500, but with fictitious dates of an earlier <coughs> period added to them. There is very little of alchemy in the Inconabula printing of the first 50 years of printing between uh, 1445 and 1500. And we have very little evidence uh, that the alchemical writings attributed to ancient authors are genuine. For example, there are books, presumably, alchemical writings of Aristotle. Also, a number of fictitious characters were invented during the 16th and 17th centuries as having lived at a much earlier date. But these inventions or unreal persons have no historical foundation. Actually, we find the phenomenon of the rise of alchemical symbolism and thought almost paralleling the rise of European astrological speculation and the rising of secret societies. Now, alchemy is not limited to European countries, that we know. Uh, remnants of it and references to it are to be found in the writings of many ancient Asiatic peoples. But the rise of alchemy in China, like that in Europe, is comparatively late when compared to the fabulous and legendary accounts thereof. So we must recognize we're in the presence of a rather mysterious situation, namely that a art or cult arose in Europe, uh, which was given an antiquity by means of a certain exaggeration on the part of those working with it. And actually, alchemy, as we are going to consider it, developed within the period between uh, about the year 1500 and the year 1700. During these two centuries, this symbolism developed and elaborated itself almost beyond human imagination. Most of the symbols employed by the alchemists were derived from earlier sources. <coughs> but there was also a wonderful a mixture of creative ingenuity evident in the designs and figures. Some are obviously derived from mythology, uh, some from natural history as it was understood or misunderstood by the writers of that period. Certain parts of it belong to the symbolisms of ancient religious cults. A part was taken from the older symbolism of astrology. Uh, still other elements are almost unique to alchemy and do not occur elsewhere. Thus, historically speaking, we are dealing with a body of lore that rose to prominence, flourished for two centuries, and then gradually declined with the rise of chemistry as we know it today. I think we should bear in mind that there was an alchemy in antiquity very roughly and inadequately drawn, but that actually, while we say that alchemy is the mother of chemistry, we might be wiser to realize that there was also a chemistry prior to alchemy, and that alchemy did not simply give rise to chemistry. Chemistry of an earlier day gave rise to alchemy, and this in turn uh, declined again, and chemistry once more emerged as the principal uh, carrier of tradition in this field of learning. Now, in consideration of these elements and factors, we are not in the presence merely of a great traditional account handed down for thousands of years, but of a cleverly devised program, integrated and perfected within a comparatively short period of time. Uh, this integration has a definite bearing upon the perpetuation of certain schools of philosophy and mysticism that originated in antiquity and also passed through various vicissitudes in the rise of European culture. Let us try to draw a picture of Europe at the time of the emergence of alchemy. 
Europe itself was coming out of the Dark Ages. It had just passed through the Renaissance of the Reformation. The human mind was beginning to break the tremendous bonds that bound medieval man to a reactionary traditionalism. The human mind was also rebelling against the dogmatic theology which dominated this entire period of European history. For several hundred years, men had been unable to use their minds. In the first place, there was no way of training minds. There were no schools. There were no universities. There was practically no opportunity for the average citizen to become educated. The second problem was that Europe was devastated by natural and man-made catastrophes. The bubonic plague swept Europe. And during the course of about 300 years, its periodic ravages total somewhere in the neighborhood of some 50 to 100 million human beings died of this plague. During this same period also, the rise of the Inquisition is to be noted, and the tremendous attack upon heresy, upon liberalism and free thinking of all kinds. Even such schools and universities as did come into existence under the great choice of school system of Charlemagne were limited by a most reactionary and patristic philosophy. Even the physician did not dare to perform autopsy, did not dare uh, to dissect the human body. He was bound completely to the writings of Galen and Avicenna, authorities, traditional authorities, whose writings covered the field from the minor elements of the human body to the probable causes of volcanic eruptions. These traditional textbooks <coughs> did not give any opportunity or any individualism to the mind of the person. He was simply schooling according to tradition. Schooled within a very narrow boundary of acceptances and rejection. Within the church itself, a number of systems of philosophy had arisen, particularly the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. This man had a magnificent mind, but bound as he was, again, by the limitations of his church and his time, he was unable to break through into the free atmosphere of liberal thinking. Rebels of that period, like Bruno, Savonarola, and even Paracelsus, paid with their lives, or with their worldly goods and honors, for their efforts to break through this traditional path. In this same period, demonism and demonology and necromancy flourished. The mysterious magic attributed to King Solomon was restored. The grimoires came into existence, and men went out to cross roads at night to invoke spirits. It was a time of rather dismal intellectual benevolence. Yet this oppression forced upon man was not exactly in order with his growth and evolution. A more ancient man had achieved much more. The Greek and Roman civilization had given the world a magnificent love. The philosophical attainments of Egypt and the Near East were spectacular. And these achievements and accomplishments did not simply die, they could not. The human being will not stop thinking and cannot stop thinking because someone tells him he must. Thus there was beneath the surface of European thought and European life a tremendous surge of intellectualism, a surge which could not break through, but which did begin to emerge as soon as the positive definition began to lift the boundaries on human thinking. So against this pressure from within the individual himself, the pressure of his own inadequacy, uh, there was the force of a limiting condition of environment. Internal pressure plus this tremendous adamant boundary fixed upon his thinking and living resulted in an explosion, resulted in a definite breaking through from the internal psychic life of the human being. Now, we cannot say, I don't agree with some psychologists who affirm that alchemy simply emerged from the individual, that it did remotely and originally do so, and that its forms undoubtedly were influenced by the pressures of the human psyche, we do not deny. But I cannot accept that it was merely a spontaneous outburst. It was too well organized, too well developed, too carefully thought through. It is far more reasonable and likely that it represented a new appearance of a tradition struggling to restore its own place as a leader in the intellectual life of the human being. Now we know, as I have told you in other lectures, 
that after the Crusades, uh, the returning Crusaders and the Templars and many other groups brought back to Europe a great deal of wisdom from the Near East. Also, the rise of Moorish culture in Spain resulted in a liberation of the human mind and a return of lines and departments of knowledge hitherto long removed from European civilization and culture. We know that all through this transition period, secret societies originating in antiquity and perpetuated quietly but strenuously by certain individuals did move beneath the surface of European life and politics. These societies, striving for survival and also for that major purpose, which was the liberation of the human mind, continued to operate uh, quietly but effectively, as we know from the stories of the troubadours, the guilds, and many other groups. Now, as far as it is possible to determine, alchemy was devised as a means of perpetuating a secret kind of knowledge under the symbolism of chemistry. Now, why was chemistry chosen? Let us read the reply by asking another question. Why did the Dionysians and later Masonic organizations use architecture for exactly the same purpose? In other words, we know uh, that the Dionysians believed that the building of a temple was a, symbol, a symbolization of the building of society and of the human soul. But at a time when it seemed advisable to move in secrecy, the active properties of the esoteric law were concealed under appropriate figures and devices. And just as the building of Solomon's temple came to mean the building of human society, so the transmutation of metals came to mean the transmutation of the personal and collective life of humanity. 